Hello, friends. want to welcome you here at The New Creation with me, your host, your friend, and your brother in Christ, Pastor Jordan Oreck. Uh, once again, welcome to The New Creation. Thank you so much for joining me here today. <clears throat> I want to encourage you as we get started, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. That way you get notified on all the content we've got rolling out. Um, you stay up to date on all that, whether it's teaching, whether it's giveaways, whether it's interviews or anything else that we have going on. So uh, go ahead and subscribe and get that out of the way. And boom, there you go. Uh, I do want to say um, last week I only got one video up. Um, I have mentioned recently um, some of the things I've got going on. In addition to being a senior pastor of a church, um, I was... I recently began, uh, was accepted into, and have begun my doctoral studies, where I will be earning a doctorate in the theology from a wonderful seminary, graduate school, uh, a school called Globe GATS, G-A-T-S is the short, that's Global Awakening Theological Seminary, that's a fully legitimately accredited seminary. Uh, it, the president of the seminary is Dr. Randy Clark. Um, very well-known charismatic minister. One of the things I love about the school, uh, and it is the graduate school of Family of Faith Christian University out of Shawnee, Oklahoma. One of the things I love about the school is, uh, of course, it's charismatic, but it's also uh, deeply in touch with and mindful of and engaged with church history. And it's very ecumenical, um, you know, approaching things and understanding things. Um, it, it's Protestant charismatic school, but it's very engaged with Catholic understanding and Orthodox understanding and these types of things. So very ecumenical to the church world, which I am very much so in for. Uh, for I mean, after all, I do have a, um, uh, let me see here. Is this doing what I need it to do? Yes. Okay. Sorry. Um, I, you know, the interview series here on the channel, of course, is unity and diversity. And so we're about much of that. Uh, also, I'm trying to think of what all uh, I did. Anyways, I got one video up last week. Uh, just wasn't, uh, I didn't get sick, sick, but I did get some sort of little thing that was irritating my throat quite a bit. And so uh, it was it's difficult to do a lot of videos. Uh, but anyways, pastoring didn't feel well, but, uh, you know, with my other responsibilities, entering in, entering into doctoral and in beginning doctoral studies. And I'm also uh, part of a seminary, Global Grace Seminary, that is, not that I'm on staff, or I don't mean that, but I'm uh, privileged among some other people there uh, to be, we are developing, we're in the beginning stages of developing a new master's degree, master's level program and curriculum for the school. It's very uh, cool, if you want to put it that way. Um, it is a, it's life coaching. And so it's going to be a new covenant, grace-based, or you might put it this way, uh, a Christocentric life coaching program. And so at, at a master's level. So I, I'm blessed to be able to help in that uh so I've been busy with that uh, as well. So anyways, uh, just be mindful of that um, as we, you know, that may, you know, naturally a lot of my attention is demanded elsewhere. But all of that being said, uh, certainly I will still be uh, getting content up here for our YouTube channel or, you know, all of you, our friends and audience here uh, there we go, uh, here on the channel. So that being said, uh, the, that's just, you know, a quick little why there was only one video last week. And nonetheless, today we are continuing teaching on understanding the book of Revelation. And today we're going to be looking at the church of Pergamum. All right. Now in, uh, uh, hopefully, let me say this, in understanding some truths, the cultural and historical, and therefore some of the theological and biblical statements that Jesus made to these churches. Uh, keep in mind, the seven churches are not 
disconnected from the rest of the book of Revelation. As I've said many times, it's absurd to think that we can somehow understand the book of Revelation without understanding, you know, anything that Jesus said to the seven churches who were the recipients of the letter. So, you know, hello. That being said, hopefully this is helping, and, and it will, you know, more so, especially once we've got all the churches, d you know, done, finished. Um, but hopefully this will be helping paint a better picture of the book of Revelation as a whole. And that is a wonderful thing. Um, with the seven churches, you know, it's to various degrees that we look at some of the historical and cultural context. We always get some of that in there, but some might be more, some might be less. And with the church of Pergamum, um, I think we're going to get a little more on that side of things, okay, uh, on the historical. So I've got a, uh, some information here for you on all of that. And again, there's lots of great resources out there. Um, I, I'm not, you know, saying what's best, what's not best, what to steer clear of or anything like that. I just want to mention there are great resources as I mentioned in the last video, and off the top of my head, some of the great resources you could find would be the works and the writings of the late David Chilton. Um, he, he's got books like Paradise Restored, Days of Vengeance, uh, just great books on these issues. Um, also, Dr., the renowned New Testament scholar uh, and author, Dr. Gordon Fee. He's got great material. Dr. Kenneth Gentry has wonderful stuff. Someone I felt I forgot to mention before, Gary DeMar has wonderful, D-E-M-A-R, Gary DeMar, wonderful information um, on eschatology as a whole. So make sure, you know, check out his stuff. Uh, Dr. Jonathan Welton has some great material like his book, Rapturless, his book, Understanding the Seven Churches of Revelation. And so lots of wonderful stuff out there uh, that you can avail uh to yourself so anyways and there's more but you know just throwing a few things out there so here we go uh the the church of pergamum is from Re uh revelation chapter 2 uh verses 12 through 17 okay and so we'll be reading the scriptures as we go through but i just want to start and again there will be um you know a fair amount of historical cultural information here so uh, we'll go ahead and jump into this um all right then the word pergamum uh literally means height or elevation height or elevation all right and pergamum was built in such a way that it's acropolis and acropolis means a citadel or a fortified part of a city that was usually built on a hill so this would be consistent with that. Uh, but Pergamum, again, was built in such a way that its Acropolis uh, did, in fact, sit on a, uh, sorry, on a high hill like in the middle, there we go, of the city. All right. So the Acropolis was in the middle of the city and it was located on a very, you know, on a high elevated area. All right. Furthermore, Pergamum was located 70 miles north of Smyrna, and Pergamum, this is important, it was the seat of the governor of the whole region. And, they, and that's big. That's an important factor here, okay? So while Ephesus was the major export uh, and trade center, export, you know, trade uh, part of uh, Asia Minor, uh, the authority, you know, was connected to Pergamum. So theologian Steve Gregg, who does a lot of good work on eschatology and, I'm, and uh, you know, lots of other stuff, I'm sure. I got a quote for you here. Theologian Steve Gregg says the following. If Ephesus was the New York City of Asia Minor, then Pergamum was the Washington, D.C. So... We we'll kind of see how important they were and their roles as major players uh, in Asia Minor and, you know, the world at that time. All right. Now, furthermore, 
Pergamum was the home of a university that was famous for both its medical study and its very impressive library. All right. Uh, the Roman philosoph philosopher Pliny referred to Pergamum as, quote, the most illustrious city in Asia. I mean, that is a big statement, right? So we see the importance and the relevance and the and sort of the role of Pergamum, if you will, in, in, the, in Asia Minor in the sense of its uh, governmental power and influence, you know, at that time. So um, now speaking of this library, this, the, this impressive library that they had contained over 200,000 volumes, making it the second largest library in the world, in the, in the world at that time, behind only the library in Alexandria, Egypt. Now, Alexandria is also a uh, a very important city in the early church in the world at that time. Um, and just, just in terms of like early church stuff, you know, origin was out of Alexandria. There were six major catechetical schools, Christian catechetical schools in the world um, during the, at that time, the very early centuries of the church world uh, or Alexandria having one of them. And you have people like Clement of Alexandria, Origen of Alexandria, um, both of whom were uh, believed in a Christian ultimate reconciliation or what's known in Greek as apokatastasis. Apokatastasis. All right. That just speaks of ultimate reconciliation. And so that was um, part of the teaching coming out of Al Matter of fact, of these six catechetical schools in the world in the early centuries of the church, four of the six held to Christian ultimate reconciliation. And so that that's something worth considering. Uh, throughout the history of the church, it's not true that um, eternal conscious torment or eternal conscious suffering have always been, you know, the only view. Uh, it's a... Some would disagree with me on this. I believe it's a valid option or a viable possibility, if you will, um, as is annihilationism, as is ultimate reconciliation. And they've all had various degrees of support in the church throughout the church's history. Uh, even St. Augustine, who held to an eternal hell, eternal conscious suffering. Um, I, don't, I don't consider it, I don't like the phrase eternal conscious torment. Uh, I consider it a straw man um, by those who don't hold to it because um, I don't believe God sends any. If there is a hell and if it is eternal, then I don't believe God sends anyone there and I don't believe he torments anyone there. I believe hell is uh, any suffering there. Any God doesn't torment people, you know, so um, hell like wrath would be. The consequences of our own beliefs and decisions and actions, not something God imposes upon us. Any, anyways, I'm not trying to get into a big hell discussion here. Just trying to some of the history and, and, and some of those things here. Okay, uh, let's see here. Uh, interesting. Uh, concerning the library here, though, the library did not uh, remain in Pergamon because in 48 BC, Julius Caesar devastated the library in Alexandria in his attack of Egypt. But when Mark Antony came to power, he restored the library in Alexandria by taking all the volumes from Pergamum and bringing them back to Alexandria and, and putting them there as a wedding gift to Queen Cleopatra. So uh, big stuff there, if you will. Um some some other in, it, it was actually in Pergamum, uh, and there were different political things going on. Uh, uh, that well, they were both competing. You know, the cities, Alexandria and Pergamum, for who had the biggest, the best library. I'm I'm a big football fan or sports fan, and in recent years in college football, the universities of Michigan and Tennessee have competed as who has the largest stadium. 
And every so often they'll build a, a build, uh, you know, an add on and, and make more room for it here. So it sort of reminds me of that and puts me in mind of that. But anyways, during this time, Alexandria put a trade embargo on uh, papyrus and uh, hindering Pergamum and, and, and their growth for their library. But because of this, the people of Pergamum created a new material called parchment. And of course, you probably understand the, the history and the importance of uh, such things. Now, also, Pergamum was home of a god by the name of, and I'm sure I'm butchering this or, or possibly at least not getting it right, um, Oslepius or Osclepius. All right. Um, so I'm going to say Os Oslepius. Os I'm going to say Osclepius. All right. And Osclepius was a healing god in the form of a serpent. All right. And even today, I'm trying to think, you know, we have the, the famous image of, of, I forget which health organization now is it? Uh, well, I forget, uh, you know, with, with, is it I'm trying to remember now my, my mind's going a little blank on me there, but, um, is, is it a, the snake around the cross or whatever it is there? But anyways, uh, a healing God. And they had this healing God, As Asclepius or Asclepius in the form of a serpent. All right. Furthermore, uh, and connected to the worship of Asclepius, there was a large health resort there in Pergamum known as the Asclepion. All right. Uh, where people would come for water baths, music, prayer, and forms of dream interpretation. It also had a 3,500-seat theater for music therapy, as well as sleep chambers where people could sleep and receive prophetic dreams. And the, and the, assumption, the assumption here is that this was some sort of drug-induced, I don't know what it was, but some sort of chemical drug-induced uh, that would provoke or, you know, promote or whatever, stimulate, you know, dreaming. All right. So... Uh, again, just, and some of this, I just have to mention, I can't really touch and get, but hopefully as I am, you know, as I mentioned that you should think of the biblical idea of, you know, in, in, you know, with Moses and then, you know, with, uh, the serpents and him, the bronze pole. And then you think of Jesus speaking of himself as Moses lifted that up. So he would be lifted up, you know? And so hopefully these biblical theme themes come to mind, um, even if I can't really touch on all of these, uh, at least just mentioning some of the high points of the culture and history can bring those things to your mind. Uh, Pergamum was also home, this is important, to a man by the name of, uh, depends, you know, Galen, G-A-L-E-N, or Galen, or Galen, um, we'll just say Galen, who is considered the father of pharmacy. So again, very important, uh, big stuff here, you know, historically. Furthermore, in, now this gets real, starts getting, you know, more important here, and we're about to get into the scriptures here and, and that, uh, but in 29 BC, Pergamum built the very first temple for Caesar worship, all right, in honor of Caesar Augustus. And this is so important. Like in the New Testament, you know, during the book of Acts and the unfolding of, of the, the early days of the church, you know, the early years and decades of the church, um, the Caesars were worshipped as gods incarnate. All right. And some of the titles. And so this, you know, there's different reasons why why being a Christian was dangerous. And um lots of those. And we'll see more of that later on in the book of Revelation when we deal with the mark of the beast and couldn't buy or sell and, you know, uh, engage in commerce and those types of things. Um, but some of the titles, for example, for the Caesars was that they were God incarnate. Uh, but another title for them was that Caesar, any Caesar at the time would be called the son of God or the son of the gods. All right. Um, also, the Caesars were known, these were official titles as 
King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So just today, when we say Jesus is Lord, we have a theological mindset of what we mean when we say that. But think, you know, in the early days of the church, saying Jesus is Lord was considered like a declaration of, you know, resistance in war in, to a certain degree and sense against Caesar. All right. And so this was this was to just say Jesus is Lord was a massive, potentially dangerous statement in the early church. All right. Uh, from from the beginning. And so it's important we understand some of these issues. All right. Um, Pergamum was not only the seat for the Roman governor of the region, as we mentioned before, but it was also home of the imperial cult. Hence, you know, that it was uh, where the first temple for Caesar worship was built. Now here, all the citizens were required to offer incense to the image of the emperors and to say, quote, Caesar is Lord. Now, again, this will come up later on more when we deal with uh, the mark of the beast and, and that, and you'll see the relevance of that in the first century. Um, all right. Also, alongside the temple of Caesar worship, there was also a massive altar built for Zeus. All right. Now, this is uh, this is actually still around, this altar for Zeus, and it's now kept in a museum in Berlin. And it's uh, you can look it up, Google it. You know, I encourage you to go to Google and look up the Pergamum altar in Berlin or Pergamum altar Berlin, and you can see it. All right. And then in some of the pictures, you can see some people or small groups of people standing around and looking at it and all of that. And so you can get an idea of some idea of the size, you know, of it. So anyways, just Google uh, Perg uh, Pergamum altar Berlin, and you'll see this. And so uh, it, it's just, it's incredible stuff, you know? So anyways, um, also the temple, um, it was also, you know, there we have the temple of, of the goddess Athena, who was the goddess of victory that stood atop the hill there. So um, th I'm t this place was just jam packed with Id idol and pagan worship. And it was the home of Caesar worship and uh, the seat for the Roman governor. So th in other words, this was not an easy place or a safe place to be professing that Jesus is Lord. Today, you know, Christians think we're under severe persecution when the president of the other party gets into office. Well, what we might consider persecution along those lines um, really pales in comparison to what people in the early church were just saying Jesus is Lord could cost you everything. If you were coming out of Judaism, your own, you know, your own family and people and culture and life and everything was considered you dead and done to you, done with you. And then, you know, similarly, even if you were a Gentile, uh, you could lose everything. Uh, your finances, you know, your business, your relationships, your social relationships. I mean, just everything, man. It, it was just, it could cost you everything. All right. Um, and then there was other gods, such as an Egyptian god uh, by the name of Serapis, Serapis uh, that also stood atop the hill uh, with these other places of worship. Now, um, let's see here. Uh, given the fact, let me point this out, that this city, Pergamum, was the home, home of the Roman governor, massive idol worship where they had continual clouds of smoke ever, you know, kind of rising up. And they even had talking idols, you know, uh, where the priests could go inside of these massive idols and had little mechanisms, mechanisms where they could make it talk, you know, and speak through it and move its mouth and that type of thing. So uh, it's no wonder 
that Jesus referred to this place as the place where Satan's throne was. And we'll read that in just a moment. Uh, but uh, again, uh, renowned theologian, the late David Chilton, uh, made this statement. Uh, he says, it was here that Satan had as established his official seat or chair of state. As Rome had become, so he says, as Rome had become the center for Satan's activity in the West, so uh, Pergamum had become his throne in the East. Okay, so, so uh, again, just trying to paint the picture here of some little idea of, of the culture that they were surrounded in. You know, um, I mean, even today here in America, we've got churches on every corner. Well, in their world, they had idols <laughs> on every corner, you know. So, all right. Now, let's get into here. Uh, and, and I don't want to take forever on some of this. We'll just be as brief as we can here. But let's get in here to uh, Jesus and, you know, his message to the church, which at Pergamum which is from, again, Revelation 2, verses 12 through 17. All right. So here, starting in verse 12, and to the angel, and if you remember the word angel means messenger, to the main, to I almost said the angel, messenger angel, to the uh, angel or messenger of the church in Pergamum, which remember Pergamum means height or elevated, right, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says, this now it's interesting to me that Jesus introduces himself here as the one with the sharp two-edged sword. Um, uh, oftentimes, we, you know, we refer to uh, the state and its its power to wield the sword, you know, and so it seems to me that Jesus is saying here that he is the one who has true authority. And so that, you know, I, I, I think of his statement in the Gospel of Matthew that in, in Caesarea, when Jesus took them to the gates, and you can find that too if you Google that, the gates of Hades, Jesus took them in Caesarea, uh, Caesar, in other words, uh, to where they believed was the, the entryway into the underworld, Hades, or in Hebrew, Sheol or Sheol, all right? And so Jesus was telling them then that the gates of Hades, uh, and I, I'm thinking also in the book of Revelation where Jesus says that he's now the one with the keys, you know, to uh, death and Hades. But anyways, Jesus speaks, of course, in Matthew chapter 16 about the gates of Hades versus, and I, I'm just using my own wording here, uh, his kingdom. So these two kingdoms. And Jesus says that the gates of Hades wouldn't be able to uphold and withstand against his kingdom, his church, his people. All right. And a lot of times we read those verses as if it's speaking that the church is on the defensive and the gates of hell are coming against us. And, and it's, hitting us left, right, front and center, but somehow, some way we'll make it. And there's a truth to that. But really, Jesus was talking about the church being on the offensive, on the march, manifesting his kingdom, and that the gates of hell would not be able to withstand against us on an offensive force, right? As an offensive force. And so Jesus is saying that he's the one with true power and with true authority. But Jesus, unlike the kingdoms of this world, his sword is not a sword of violence. It's the sword coming out of his mouth. It's the sword of his word. All right. His word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Right. And so we understand it's the power of of Jesus' message, his truth, his gospel, his good news um, that will stand, all right? The kingdoms of this world. I think of Daniel chapter 2, Daniel chapter 7, I, Isaiah, different places where the kingdoms of this world will not stand and endure forever, but the kingdom of God will. 
Hallelujah. All right. Kingdoms come and go, but the kingdom of God stands forevermore. Powerful. All right. So in verse 13, Jesus says, I know where you dwell. Let me get my notes put right here where I need them. Um, he says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. So we, we address that. And you just with all the idolatry and worship and just Caesar worship and all of it. Um, where Satan's throne is and you hold fast to my name and did not deny my faith even in the days of Antipas, my witness, my that word witness uh, could also be my martyr, same Greek word, my faithful one who was killed among you where Satan dwells. Um, now, let me see here. I don't have, uh, I don't have time to be able to read all of this. All of the, you know, again, I encourage you, let this serve as a, a sort of a launch pad, if nothing else, for you to investigate and look into these, you know, for yourself, uh, these things for yourself. Um, let me see here. Um, another reason that perhaps that Jesus referred to this place as where Satan dwells also had to do with this, we mentioned earlier, this this god, uh, Asclepius, Asclepius, whose image was that of a serpent. Now, Asclepius' title was Soter, or Savior. Think Soteriology, the doctrine, the study of salvation. Well, that's what he was called, or that was his title, Soter, Savior. So, uh, again, Jesus is showing here, I have authority. I'm the Savior, not the false gods around you. All right? Now, Antipas here, uh, we don't know a lot about Antipas, uh, but just a few things here. Antipas, uh, his the name Antipas means like the father. And I think that's so beautiful, you know. Uh, we are told from one ancient document that Antipas was the bishop of Pergamum. So I like to think that he was a fatherly figure to the Christians there who were enduring such incredible hardships. You know, Paul spoke of not having, uh, having lots of instructors, you know, but not fathers. And Antipas was not just an instructor. He was a father. He didn't just tell the way he showed and modeled the way to the point that it cost him his own life. All right. Um, he was appointed bishop by John prior to John being exiled on Patmos. And he was martyred while John was still there. Now, this is interesting. In the little bit of information we have about Antipas, we're told um, that people came to him. Now, remember, there was a big medical you know, university, and that was part of the, the cultural milieu there. And we're told that Antipas helped people with dental problems. All right? And... Um, sometimes, you know, he would use natu whatever natural means and remedies and type things they had, but that he would also heal people by praying for them in the name of Jesus, as opposed to the false gods there, and in, in part and parcel to that, by casting out demons, you know. We see in the Gospels, of course, in the, in the book of Acts, demons being cast out and people being healed as those spirits of infirmity and affliction and its sickness and disease uh, departed from people through the power, hallelujah, that is in the name of Jesus. Oh, love it. Um, anyways, now Antipas would not charge anybody, cert, you know, a certain set price or anything like that, but he would just accept free will offerings. But we're told that in, you know, in the midst of all this and in light of all of this, that the other local dentists and healers were very threatened naturally by Antipas as more and more patients and customers were being drawn to him. Number one, because of his success. Hello. And I'm, and, and I'm sure the fact that he didn't charge probably as much money or whatever. You know, I mean, he didn't charge. He only accepted 
free will offerings. So I'm sure all of that made it much more um, the threat to his local comp, you know, business competition, as it were. So um, now, all right, let's see here. Uh, yeah, so he was seen as both a religious, you know, and a financial threat. So history tells us that one day, uh, the people were in an uproar over him and that a mass, a mob, you know, descended upon him, that they dragged him to the temple of Serapis and they enclosed him in a bronze bowl and burned him alive as an act of worship to Serapis. This, my friends, is real persecution. You know what I'm saying? I'm not belittling the fact that we do have very real problems in America and, and the culture isn't as Christian friendly as maybe it has been in days gone by and, and stuff like that. But I think understanding stuff like this can help us to put some things in a proper perspective. All right. Now, so just like Jesus said, Antipas was faithful unto death. Now, so not much longer here, uh, about 35, six minutes into this, just a little bit more here. Um, Jesus goes on here. And we're going to look in verses uh, 14 here and 15. Jesus says, but I have a few things against you because you have there some who hold to the teaching of Balaam who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. Uh, so you also have some, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, let me get this up here. There we go. There's the last part of the verse. Things sacrificed to idols and to commit acts of immorality. Then he says in verse 15, So you also have some in the same way who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Therefore, verse 16, uh, Repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Verse 17, He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hid, hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone with a new name on it, which no one knows but he who receives it. All right, so let's just unpack a little bit of that there. Now, with Balaam and Balak, uh, you can read about that account rather quickly in the book of Numbers, uh, chapters 22 through 25. Um, and then the whole story is there and important. And in chapter uh, 25 in particular, so 22, 3, and 4, we see all the interaction between King Balak. Balak uh, was the king of Moab, all right? And he wants to hire Balaam, who was a seer, you, you know. Uh, he wanted to hire him to curse the Israelites, all right? And so, the, but he couldn't do it. Now, Balaam told Balak several times, you know, I can't do anything other than what God, the God of, you know, the living God, what God tells me to do. But, so Balaam would tell him that, but Balaam still kind of wanted to get in on the big payday somehow or another. So he would, on one hand, he would say, well, I can't say anything, you know, other than what God tells me to say. I can't say anything other than the words that he puts in my mouth. But in so many words, you know, as almost like, but I'll go inquire of the Lord about it and see what can happen. So he kind of knew on one hand, but he kind of wanted that big payday on the other, you know, kind of a, you know, one of those situations. So, um. Let me see here. Yeah, and then you get into Numbers chapter 25, and you can see where uh, they were 
Israel, where the Israelites, or a, a portion of them, were engaging in with the Moabites, we see in Numbers 25, this stumbling block, as it's put there, that how they were engaging in their pagan feast and worshiping their false gods and engaging in sexual immorality uh, at the same time, okay? So we see that happening there. Sorry, I'm hitting my stand there, knocking my computer around. So we see that there uh, in verse 14 where Jesus addresses, you know, Balaam and Balak and all that. Now notice here, the, the he says, to eat things sacrificed to idols and acts of immorality. And I'm not going to turn there, but you could check out 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and you can see where Paul dealt with this uh, with the Corinthians. And, you know, Paul even said to them that you can't partake of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons at the same time. But you can understand, as we've painted the picture here, the amount of cultural um, financial and whatever else pressure that was being put upon them, you know? And so this, this wasn't an easy thing to just say, no, you know, this, this would cost you everything, including your life. All right. But the Lord is exhorting them. And as he exhorts us to be faithful like Antipas, even if it costs you your life. And this was a major thing in the early church. The early Christians uh, the, the church fathers and their writings, we see how the early church was not only willing, but like excited to be a martyr. You know, even Peter, who Jesus prophesied to him that in John's gospel, that his faith would cost him his life. We know that Peter uh, was humbled, you know, not, not just not... Uh, you know, there might have been some fear and stuff, I'm sure, but just from this, you know, in his relationship with the Lord, the humility and the courage that it took for him, because Peter said, I am not worthy. Church history tells us, he said, I'm not worthy to die as my Lord, as my Savior did. So Peter, at his own request, not only died a martyr via crucifixion, but at his own request, he was crucified upside down because he did not feel worthy to die the same way that Jesus did. Hallelujah. All right. And so um, that's the sort of exhortation that we see here. Okay. Now, again, uh, so in that, and then we also have in verse 15, he says that, now notice here, Jesus says, so also you have some who hold in the same way, and we, we dealt with this in one of the previous churches to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Now, church history tells us that this particular Nicholas is one of the, the servant deacons in Acts chapter 6 that was selected uh, to serve, right? And, but the problem was he started teaching not what Jesus and Paul taught, a servant form of leadership, but a heavy-handed hierarchical form of leadership where their they their desire was to conquer and dominate the laity and i see this we see this in church the church world all the time in whether protestant catholic orthodox it's out there charismatic cessationist across the board you know this stuff is out there uh unfortunately uh the body of christ our leaders need to realize you know, we, we talk all the time, come to the church and serve the man of God's vision. You know, the, the truth is the man of God, the woman of God is the servant who leads, not just by pointing, but by going. And that way the people can follow. And we do that by serving them. All right. And so anyways, a lot to all that. But anyways, trying to wrap this up here. Uh, it's very interesting. The Lord says, uh, repent or else I'm coming to you quickly and will make war with them. So the Lord is specifying, I'm to those of you who are holding and clinging to my truth, I'm coming on your behalf, not only to aid you against the, you know, those outside of the church, but even those inside of the church. 
The Lord says, I am coming and the sword of my mouth, my truth, my word will protect you and win out. All right. Hallelujah. So and then in verse 17, in closing, uh, the Lord says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches, to him who overcomes. Now, we've dealt with this previously. People preach this and they say you, you overcome, you know, by living holy and all this and, and all this stuff. Um, that's I believe in living holy. But the scripture tells us in first John, the same John who wrote this in first John four and in first John chapter five, that to overcome. John tells us who is who who is he who overcomes except he who believes that Jesus is the son of God. And he also says that uh, we we overcome. I mean, he just he kind of says it in a couple of different ways. But like when he says greater is he who's in us than he who's in the world. You know, it's in other words, it's not about us. It's about Christ in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory. We don't overcome by doing something. We overcome by grace through faith, by being joined to him who overcome. And we are now, as Paul says, more than conquerors through Christ. Jesus is the conqueror. He did the conquering. But we're his bride. We get to participate in his having overcome, in his overcoming victory. That's more than a conqueror. That's what it means biblically, not religiously, but biblically to overcome. So to him who overcomes, that is, has faith in Jesus, clings to him, I will give him of the hidden manna. Now, I think this hearkens to, at, the, at least partially, to partaking of the love feast, as the early church was fond of calling it, of Holy Communion. You know, when you consider, you know, over and against all the paganism and idolatry that the church at Pergamum was just utterly surrounded by, okay? So, and, you know, and, and I mentioned earlier, Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 dealing with this same thing um, about not partaking of the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons at the same time, but to stay faithful and to hold fast to the truth, you know, to not give in to pressure. Um, and then I think we could also, you know, and again, you think later, I think, you know, Revelation 19 about the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so the, the marriage supper of the Lamb is not some yet future thing that we're waiting to happen. Again, this was all fulfilled. Uh, there's ongoing realities, don't misunderstand me, but the historical fulfillment uh, was in the first century. So, you know, the events surrounding 70 AD, the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. All right. And what was going on with the church being persecuted in the book of Revelation, you have two beasts, the land beast and the sea beast. One of those is Rome. The other is the synagogue of Satan, as Jesus calls it, or apostate Israel, apostate Jerusalem, the apostate system that had abandoned and rejected Yahweh by rejecting and crucifying and murdering their own Messiah. All right. Now, so another thing we should think, so the marriage supper of the lamb, the covenant meal, that is holy communion. All right. Now, another thing we should think of in light of this, though, this uh, this hidden manna, that's Jesus himself. You know, that's why holy communion is so special. It's the body and bread, of, body and bread, body and blood of our Lord in the bread and wine as the church has always maintained until Zwingli started saying otherwise 1,600 years later. But the church, East and West, Latin and Greek, doesn't matter, Catholic, Orthodox, doesn't. The church has always maintained that while there is symbolism in Holy Communion, it is not just a symbol. It is in some capacity. And I'm not going to you know, whether you like consubstantiation, transubstantiation, spiritual presence, whatever, it's the body and blood of our Lord, as scripture repeatedly tells us, and as church history has universally maintained. All right. Why would we reduce something so beautiful as the, the covenant meal of communion? It's a, a 
special form of intimacy with our heavenly husband that we don't get through any other means, all right? And boy, there's so much in Holy Communion. Don't have time for all of that. But Jesus is the hidden manna, all right? So anyways, and then lastly, the Lord speaks here to him who overcomes. I will give some of the hidden manna. And then going on, lastly, he says, and I will give him a white stone and a new name on the stone, which no one knows, but he who receives it. Um, without getting into all the, you know, possible things here, I just want to mention in, because I'm, I'm, you know, wrapping this up here, um, this white stone, this new name. Um, one thing, again, when we read scripture, when we read Revelation, we want to think scripturally. Uh, it, we want to understand the cultural and historical context, which we're, we're laboring to do here. And, and I commend you and thank you for joining me in that very much so. Um, and, uh, but also we want to interpret scripture, you know, with scripture. All right. And so, uh, let's see here. Get, uh, South 410, uh, says, thank, Hey, says, thank you. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> thank you for that. I, I, for real, thank you so much. Um, and so, uh, let me see here. Where was, uh, 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 the, sorry, uh, the, the white stone, the new name. Uh, hopefully I don't sound too rambly or, or absent minded today. I was uh, up till after two o'clock last night, not because I wanted to be, I just absolutely could not sleep. But anyways, um, one of the things, you know, in terms of wanting to think scripturally and interpret scripture with scripture, think of a new name. Well, what about Abram? What about Sarai? What about Paul, you know, and other people in scripture where the Lord changed their name? And a lot of, and I don't pretend to fully understand that, but I think a lot of what that has to do is the Lord would change someone's name to help them identify with their new purpose. You know, it's a new name with your new identity. It almost, you know, like being born again, you know, you, you, you know, it's a new identity, you know, in and of itself. And so, um, I also think of how a bride receives a new name and we're the bride of Christ. And so we're, we, we are no longer labeled and identified under the name of Adam. Hallelujah. But the name of the new man, you know, the last Adam, our, our heavenly husband, King Jesus, right? And so now Adam does not identify us anymore. Jesus alone identifies us and he alone is our reality. And it also symbolizes, you know, how a husband and bride, she'll take on, a bride will take on her husband's name. That symbolizes the absolute oneness, all right? Their oneness. And that shows um, our oneness with the Lord. And just, just a brief last thing here in closing. Um, if you think of Martin Luther and his 95 theses and how he, you know, went and, uh, you know, hammered it to the door of the church of Wittenberg and all that, you know, um, that was a very common practice in that day. That was not unique to Luther at all. That's how people would open up, you know, public discourse and, and want to it was actually a way uh, of debate. It's how they would engage in debate. And so it was a way of inviting people to come. Well, here's what I'm saying. Uh, let, if you say otherwise, let's have a public discourse about it. You know, that type of thing. Um, well, here, this was also a common practice uh, in the ancient world at that time. Uh, it was common where in the culture, uh, important announcements would be made and they would take a white stone and they would put the announcement on it and then they would mount it on a uh, another darker stone behind it and make a sort of placard out of it. So again, you just see that Jesus is speaking to them in words they can understand and that relates to them. Thank God, just as he speaks to us in terms and ways and words that we can understand and that make sense to us while always pointing us to his universal truth, all right, as revealed in Jesus in the scriptures. So, all right, well, that covers, I don't, I don't mean 
uh, I don't mean, you know, I'm not saying there's not more to say, <laughs> but that finishes, let me put it that way, that finishes up here our uh, looking at the Church of Pergamum. And so I do hope that helps you. And let me mention here, if you haven't already, please do. No, don't do that. Don't do a disappearing act like I did. That's not what I meant to do. Um, well, here we go. Ha! There we go. Now you see it. Please subscribe to the channel. Uh, and, and no, this is the, uh, this is, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're several churches into this. And so we got a handful of more to go. And so I hope this is helping you and shedding some light on some things for you. I, I tell you, this stuff is just exciting. Making the book of Revelation make sense. I mean, it's amazing that we're so confused about Revelation, a book that by its very title claims to reveal something. You know, this is one of the things that drove me into studying biblical eschatology. Uh, because I knew that God is not the author of confusion, and these things simply had to make sense. And thank God they do. I don't claim for a second to have all the answers, but I do thank God that, you know, there are answers out there, and we're learning and uh, getting more of these things here. So anyways, uh, South 410, man, thank you so much there. I, I sincerely thank you and appreciate that. And there are more videos to come. Uh, I'm saying that to everyone. So anyways, um, again, like and subscribe. Uh, we are working very hard. Hopefully this week, we're going to have our some of our merch up. We've got a lot of the stuff in. We're just trying to get it finished up and put together. Uh, we've got new creation ball caps. We're going to have hoodies. I've already showed you, I think. Uh, I think I've should. Yeah, I did a video with uh, a new creation t-shirt, a new uh, the new creation, a gospel worthy of the name. So um, got uh, that type of stuff coming, got giveaways coming, going to be doing giveaways with my book, uh, my first book that I've written so far. Um, so, uh, and merch and stuff. But of course, in order for that, you to be part of that, at the very least, you will need to be subscribed and then we'll let you know the rest of it coming up here. Also, if you're interested, you can check us out over at our Patreon page. Um, and there with Patreon, you can partner with us on a monthly basis at very low prices. Um, so uh, you can check us out at Patreon, the new creation, just like here, the new creation, Jordan Oric. So check that out and you can get exclusive content there that is not and won't be available anywhere else. I'm trying to think, I think the lowest tier, I don't want to say, cause I don't want to, I don't want to do a little false advertisement. I think the lowest tier is $7, $5 a month, something like that maybe 10. I don't even think it's 10 though. So pretty sure it's not, but anyways, you can check us out there. And, but anyways, the main thing, I just want to encourage you being part of our YouTube channel here, being part of the conversation and the community. I welcome comments. I welcome questions. Doesn't mean I'll have answers, but do what I can. Um, I welcome disagreement. I, I do prefer, you know, that it's done in a civil, mature manner. You don't have to come on here and Call me a heretic and tell me I'm going to hell. That's your prerogative, you know, but uh, I'm less likely to engage when that's going on. So, um, but I love to do videos based off of people's comments or questions or just that type of stuff. So in other words, just be part of the conversation and our community here that we are building. All right. I just think we've got great things in store going forward and uh, I encourage you to be part of it. All right. Well, we're coming up on an hour here and that is all that I have for you here with the Church of Pergamum. So once again, this is the new creation. I am Pastor Jordan Oric. I am so thankful that you joined me here on this. If you like the video and it does anything for you, feel free to share it and um, like it. And um, anyways, thank you so much. Once again, I pray God's rich, wonderful, abundant blessings upon you and your family and your life. Thank you so much for joining me. Hopefully I will see you next time. Thank you so very much. God bless. See you next time.